Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we're continuing our discussion of antimicrobial drugs. This is recording part two. The, the class of antibiotics that you're most likely to encounter in the operating room are drugs that affect the cell wall or the cell membrane. These are drugs that interfere with synthesis of the cell wall, which makes them bactericidal. And so they're mostly used against gram-positive bacteria that have an exposed cell wall. For example, broad-spectrum penicillins. They have anaerobic coverage and pseudomonas as well. So looking at penicillins, like amoxicillin or nafcillin, these are all beta-lactams. Here's a picture of a penicillin, and the beta-lactam ring is this structure right here. And then, depending on whether it's a penicillin or a cephalosporin, we'll see different rings and side chains attached to it. When you administer beta-lactam drugs, bacteria have come up with ways to be resistant. They can inactivate them using an enzyme called beta-lactamase. They can modify proteins called penicillin-binding proteins that are on the surface of the bacteria so that the penicillin can no longer bind. They can change the way drug is taken into the cell or increase pumping the drug back out of the cell once it invades. In turn, we have come up with a way to overcome the resistance. For example, we have beta-lactamase inhibitors. So we see combinations like unison, which is ampicillin and sulbactam, zosin, which is piperacillin and tazobactam, augmentin, which is amoxicillin and clavulanic acid. Patients can have all sorts of adverse reactions to penicillins, ranging from hypersensitivity reactions like anaphylaxis, rash, and fever, delayed reactions, and even GI upset, nausea, vomiting, and of course, Clostridium difficile infections. Cephalosporins are also beta-lactams, and they come in multiple generations. An example of each is listed here. Cephalozolin is a first generation. Cefuroxime is second generation. Cefoxetin is also second generation. Ceftrioxone is third generation, and cefepime is fourth generation. These are similar to penicillins, although somewhat more stable. They're excellent for coverage of skin flora, and they really are the drug of choice for cardiovascular, orthopedic, biliary, pelvic, and intra-abdominal surgery. As we get to higher generation drugs, they tend to have more gram-negative coverage, which would make them better in GI or maybe neuro cases, as well as more resistance to beta-lactamases and better penetration of the blood-brain barrier. Nevertheless, in our institution, we routinely use cefazolin, which is a first-generation cephalosporin, for neurological procedures. The resistance to cephalosporins is similar to what we see with penicillins, and the adverse reactions are also similar, although anaphylaxis is uncommon. The drug you see the most is cefazolin, also called Ansef or Kefzol. We usually give a gram every three to four hours, going up to two grams if they're more than 80 kilograms, and we use, more, we use three grams when patients are greater than 120 kilograms. The dose in children is 25 milligrams per kilogram, up to a maximum dose of two. Do cephalosporins have cross-reactivity with penicillins when it comes to allergy? So this is controversial because, first of all, a lot of patients who claim to be allergic to penicillin aren't actually allergic. They don't know what their reaction was. Somebody told them they were allergic when they were a child, or the experience they had may have not been a true allergy. On the other hand, patients who really are allergic to penicillin have a three times increased risk of allergic reaction to all other, even non-related drugs. Now, some old data suggested that there's a 10% cross-reactivity, but it may have been that there was some contamination between the penicillins and the cephalosporin samples being administered to patients. Most importantly, what we need to know is that not all cephalosporins are the same. So, for example, Kefzol is not the same as Keflex even though they sound the same. And for that, we should take a look at structure. So if we assume that people are allergic to the beta-lactam ring, then they should be equally allergic to all of these drugs. But in fact, most people are allergic to some of these side chains that are on different parts of the molecule. So looking at the side chain on penicillin or on ampicillin is very similar to the side chain on cephalexin or keflex, but quite different from the side chain on cefoxetin or kefazolin. And so if patients are allergic to these side chains, we really don't expect there to be any cross-reactivity at all. 
So what's the take home message? If patients have a minor penicillin allergy, so they have a rash or a fever, it's probably safe to give them cephalosporins. But if they have anaphylaxis to penicillin, most people will avoid giving cephalosporins, even though biochemically the risk is low. But since anaphylaxis is so life-threatening, we go to a different class of drugs altogether. Let's talk about a few other cell wall agents. Vancomycin inhibits cell wall synthesis. And so it works mostly against gram-positive bacteria. Now, it's not as effective as cephalosporins against skin flora, so we always prefer to use cephalosporins when we can. But where vancomycin becomes very useful is in the treatment of MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. This is a bacteria that colonizes the body routinely, and many of us may be colonized with MRSA, often in the nostrils. And so what we'll do is we will culture patients with a nasal swab to see if they grow out MRSA. Now, if you look at the labs, it won't mention methicillin. Actually, what it looks at is oxacillin. So maybe we should be calling it ORSA, but we still call it MRSA. And if patients have MRSA staph aureus, then we add vancomycin to their prophylactic treatment. The dose of vancomycin is 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram, given IV every 8 to 12 hours. In patients who have renal insufficiency, the vancomycin will accumulate, and so we have to be careful with our dosing in these patients. Usually it's every 12 hours, and often we check a vancomycin level, also called a trough, before we redose to make sure that they've fallen low enough that they're due for an actual redose. Vancomycin can also be given orally, in which case it doesn't get absorbed well into the bloodstream, but it treats Clostridium difficile colitis in the GI tract. Common adverse reactions to vancomycin include fever and chills, irritation, and more rarely, ototoxicity or nephrotoxicity. The Redman syndrome, which we discussed before, is a non-immune mediated histamine release, and it occurs more with fast infusion, so we should really try to give vancomycin over at least an hour. Daptomycin is good for vancomycin-resistant bacteria, mostly effective against gram-positive, it's expensive and usually given as a slow bolus. We also have carbapenems, like meropenem or imipenem. They are beta-lactams, but they don't seem to cause allergy in patients with penicillin allergy. So they are considered safe in certain patients with penicillin allergy. They are effective against gram-negative and anaerobic bacteria, as well as pseudomonas. That's it for our discussion of the cell wall drugs. We'll continue with the rest of the antibiotics in the next recording.